Good morning. A very warm welcome to our worship here this morning at Mayfield Salisbury Parish Church. Welcome to everyone who's here in the sanctuary and welcome to those who are online who are at home. Good morning to you as well. It's lovely to welcome you all to our worship this morning, whether you're here as a regular worshipper in the Church of Scotland, whether you're here on holiday or on a vacation, or you're visiting family or friends, whatever brings you here this morning, we're united as one, the body of Christ in God's house to worship Him. A particular welcome to friends from Priestfield and Craig Miller Park Parish churches. Uh, we have our joint services in July and August, so all our services are at 10.30 a single service, all three congregations brought together in anticipation of our union next year. And it's lovely to share in those who are in the welcoming team this morning and in the next few weeks, we'll be sharing in those who are reading and indeed those who are leading worship. Next Sunday, uh, Donald Scott, the minister at Priestfield, will be leading worship along with myself next Sunday morning. Our organist, Kate, is on our summer holidays, so it's lovely to welcome back Ian Campbell to play for us this morning. Thank you, Ian, for playing last week and this week and next. It's uh, great to have you with us at the organ console. During the summer services, we have no young church and a lot of our families are away, uh, but we do have uh, space in the transept and we have some young people with us this morning and you're there already, which is great. Uh, but if any other youngsters who are with us who'd like to um, enjoy some crafts and some drawing and some games through in the transept over there, do feel welcome. I think there's some colouring as well uh, going around that you can get some pens and colour with too, uh, but do feel free to use that transept space. Over uh, the last few weeks, up until today, over the five services, we have been going on a pilgrimage to Iona Abbey over on the west coast of Scotland and using as a backdrop the life of St Columba and the life of the Benedictine Abbey in the Middle Ages to explore uh, meaning that that might have for our personal faith and for our church life in the 21st century. So over the last few weeks, we've looked at the journey of St. Columba and his arrival on Iona. We've looked at the monk's cell as a place of private contemplation and meditation and prayer. We've looked at the chapel as a place of gathering to worship. And last week, the cloister and the chapter house as places of meeting together and of building community together. And today, the garden and the refectory, the work in the garden and the fruits of God's creation, sharing the fruits of God's creation together and offering hospitality. Uh, coming up this week in Church Life here, we have prayers on a Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock in the Newington room beside the office, and also Coffee and Blenders is on this Thursday afternoon. You'll see that at the back of the order service, and everyone's very much welcome. And indeed, you're all very welcome to tea and coffee after the service today through in the Bill McDonald Hall. And if you're unfamiliar with the layout here, it's through the door to my right and follow the corridor round. Everyone's very welcome to join after the service for tea and coffee and refreshments. It'd be good to see you there. As we prepare to worship God, let us turn to one another and invite you to to offer the peace if you would wish to do so. Um, it's not, don't feel obliged to, but if you want to uh, offer peace to those round about us as we gather, then do turn around and say the peace of Christ be with you. Shall we say together the words of our call to worship on the order of service from the Iona Abbey worship book. Creator of the world, eternal God, we have come from many places for this short while. Redeemer of humanity, God with us, 
we have come seeking common ground in you. Spirit of unity, go between God. We have come to a place where journeys meet. So here, in this shelter house, we take time together to worship. For when paths cross and pilgrims gather, there is much to share and celebrate. Let us share and celebrate as we worship God together. We sing hymn number 200 in the purple hymnary. Christ is made the sure foundation. Let us come before God in prayer. Shall we pray together? O God, for your love for us, warm and caring, which has brought us to birth and opened our eyes to the wonder and the beauty of your creation, we give you thanks today. For your love for each one of us, wild and freeing, which has awakened us to the energy of creation, to the sap that flows, to the blood that pulses, to the heart that sings, we give you thanks. For your love for us, which is compassionate and patient, which has carried us through times of pain, which has wept beside us in times of need, which has waited with us in our confusion, 
we give you thanks for your love for us, which is strong and challenging, which has called us to take risks for you, which has asked for the best in us and shown us how to serve. We give you thanks. O oh God, we come to celebrate that your Holy Spirit is present deep within us and at the heart of all life. Forgive us when we forget your gift of love made known to us in Jesus, and draw us into your presence. Loving God, open our hearts so that we may feel the breath of your Spirit. Unclench our hands so that we may reach out to one another and touch and be healed. Open our lips that we may drink in the delight and the wonder of life. Open our eyes so that we might see Christ in friend and stranger. Breathe your Spirit into us, Lord, and touch our lives with the life of Christ, in whose words we join together in prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Summer time is upon us, and summer holidays are upon us, and as sure as eggs are eggs, when it's summer holiday times, you hear the news telling us about all kinds of disruption as people try to get away on holiday. They try to get to foreign parts, or they try to visit friends or relatives within the UK, and there's big queues everywhere, it seems. At uh, railway stations, people are queued up trying to get on trains. The air traffic controllers in France always seem to go on strike in July. Uh, and if people are trying to get to a, a channel ferry or even get across the country, it can often look a bit like this. There's gridlock, there's cars backed up against each other. And uh, if you're a parent or a grandparent, you'll know if that sort of thing happens and there's wee ones in the back of the car, it can be a rather challenging situation. And it's time for some games to appear. One of the ones we used to play when our kids were smaller was to spot cars of different colors. Who'd be the first one to spot a yellow car or a yellow lorry? And there's one up on the left there straight away. So you would get the first point for spotting that, anything to try and keep their attention. Another game we used to play was called the Minister's Cat. I don't know if you've ever come across the Minister's Cat, but what you do in the Minister's Cat is you put an adjective in front of the minister's cat, and you go through the alphabet. So you say the minister's cat is an angry cat, and then you say the minister's cat is an angry cat and a bashful cat. The minister's cat is an angry cat, etc., etc., etc. Little did I know that 20 years later I would be a minister with a cat. <laughs> so I could really play the minister's cat. And uh, this is my cat, Ollie. Uh, Ollie isn't angry or bashful, as you can see, he's very chilled indeed. As long as he gets his 18 hours a day of sleep, everything is, everything's all right. It's not just travel that can be monotonous sometimes and a bit boring. Work can sometimes be a bit monotonous and boring. This job accepted, of course. Work can be a bit, a bit monotonous, and uh, sometimes we can struggle to see the point, uh, whether it's we're in full-time employment, or part-time employment, or volunteering, or even just chores around the house. Sometimes it just feels as if you're putting one foot in front of the other and nothing much is happening with it. It can feel a bit like the uh, character in Greek mytholo mythology, Sisyphus. I don't know if you've ever heard of the story of Sisyphus, but the legend is that as a punishment, Sisyphus had to push a huge boulder up the hill, and once it got to the top of the hill, the boulder would run back down to the bottom again, and Sisyphus had to return to the bottom and push the boulder back up to the top of the hill again and on and on and on. You probably can't see that cartoon from many places in the church, but the cartoon, it's Sisyphus's boss saying to him, hey Sisyphus, 
when you've got a minute, I'd like to discuss this progress report with you. And Sisyphus is saying, uh-oh. So sometimes the task we have to do in life can feel a bit like Sisyphus, pushing the boulder up and down the hill all the time, trying to get on, trying to do what we have to do, but not quite ever getting there. We've been looking over the last few weeks at life in the monastery and the nearby nunnery in, on Iona, and one of the tasks the monks had to do that was essential was to work, and they had to work in the garden. Now, when we think of garden, particularly in the city, it's got an image in our mind, I'm sure, of a beautiful, relaxing place, a place to relax, a place of comfort and ease. But of course, the garden in medieval times wasn't really a place like that at all. It was essential to survive, to grow food. And the monks had to work in the garden every day, as well as their daily life of prayer and worship and gathering and living together in community. Working in the garden was essential to grow food, not only for themselves and everyone in their community, but also, particularly in the Middle Ages, increasingly the number of pilgrims that came to visit um, great places like Iona and St. Andrews and Canterbury and Lindisfarne, etc. There would be all these visitors who would come who would need hospitality. And that was very much part of the idea of the Abbey, that it would be an open place of hospitality for friend and stranger alike. One of our passages today that Walter read from is from Genesis, in Genesis chapter 1 in the creation story. The creation story says that God gave the seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth, and every tree that has fruit with seed in it, they will be yours for food. So the idea is very much there that the creation that God has given us, we've been given to tend, not to destroy um, or despoil um, in the ways we can think of that currently in our climate crisis of the way the earth has been abused over the centuries, but to care for God's creation, but to care for God's creation in the way that will provide us and others with food, because the seed-bearing plants are there for us to eat. It says at the beginning uh, of Ecclesiastes that um, workers may find satisfaction in their toil. That's a gift from God. So that idea is running through Scripture that work, even if sometimes it feels a bit dull, whether it's what we do around the house or whether it's what we do as a full-time job, always has a purpose. It has a bigger purpose in God's eyes, and there will be ways of finding satisfaction in it for ourselves and for others, for providing for others. And that was at the heart of some of the Scripture passages and also of the life of the Abbey we've been thinking about, that, that working in whatever small way we do has a benefit not only for us, but for other people and for the world beyond us. And certainly we need to provide sometimes for ourselves and others, and the minister's cat needs to be kept in whiskers too. We're going to sing now a hymn which is all about serving others. It's all about living our lives for ourselves, but also for other people caring in our communities. It's brother, sister, let me serve you.
The Old Testament lesson is taken from the book of Genesis, chapter 1, and beginning at verse 26. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth, and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth, and all the birds in the sky, and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude And on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. Because on it, God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. We sing together our hymn 231 for the fruits of all creation.
The New Testament lesson is taken from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, beginning at verse 42. The Fellowship of the Believers. They devoted themselves to the Apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the Apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. For the word of God revealed through scripture, thanks be to God. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, Lord God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You might have seen the sketch from Monty Python, where the chief Jewish conspirator against the Romans is trying to inspire his fellow citizens to revolt. And at the end of a rousing speech, he shouts out, they've taken everything we had, not just from us, but from our fathers, and from our father's fathers, and what have the Romans ever given us in return? And after a long list is slowly reeled off by the crowd, he's forced to concede, all right, all right, but apart from better sanitation and medicine and education and irrigation and public health and roads and a fresh water system and baths and public order, what have the Romans ever done for us? And one man pipes up, brought peace. What? Peace? Will you just shut up? <laughs> Over the past five Sunday services, we've gone on a pilgrimage around Iona Abbey through the lives of the monks in the medieval Benedictine communities there and at the nearby nunnery. And we've asked similarly, what did the monks ever do for us? Did the Reformation that came to Scotland in 1560 not sweep away the monastic life? Did it not tear down the graven images and the superstitious practices and herald in a new era of faithful devotion to God through Scripture? In some ways, maybe yes, a back to basics reconnection with God. But in other ways, much has been lost as a consequence. By imagining that the journey towards God can only be traveled through head knowledge through rationality and understanding, an enlightenment view that's now compromised by the secularization of the West in our time, and not through emotion, through beauty, through contemplation and silence, through pilgrimage and labyrinth, through music and art. Not to mention the aspects of monastic life that we've explored in recent weeks through the sacred spaces that can be found in Iona Abbey and elsewhere. The monks sell, speaking of personal private devotion, of discipline and prayer, the chapel of gathering regularly to worship together, the cloister and the chapter house of chance and plan meetings and decisions that form a community in a bond. And today the garden and the refectory, sharing work and food and hospitality. What did the monks ever do for us? Perhaps in their formation of community, in their unity of work and worship, all crucially underpinned by their devotion to Jesus Christ. They might provide a model of what a Christian community should aspire to for this church united as Newington Trinity going forward, and indeed a model that might apply more broadly to life in our wider society. Their model, the model that the monks had in the Abbey, echoes the fellowship of the believers 
of the earliest Christians in Jerusalem just after Pentecost that Walter read for us in Acts 2. For we find there that like the monk's cell, the believers devoted themselves to prayer and to praising God. Like the chapel, they did so by gathering in the temple courts. Like the cloister and the chapter house, their community was formed by being together, by sharing everything in common. And like the garden and the refectory, that eating together, as it says there, with glad and sincere hearts, was such a prominent part of their unity with one another. But is this model of unity and harmony realistic now? Or is it more of a pipe dream than an attainable reality in our present day? Is it more like a historical curiosity from more primitive times than ours? John Lennon's song, Imagine, dreams of a world where there are no rules and there is no religion too, and believes that will be a world where we'll all be living life in peace. The Christian writer Francis Spufford, in his book Unapologetic, describes John Lennon's words as the my little pony of philosophical statements. Without religion, Spufford says, peace is not the state of being that we would return to like water running downhill when there's nothing external to disturb us. Instead, he says, peace between people is an achievement. Peace is not the norm. Peace is rare. Without rules or a moral framework like Christianity, we are more likely to destroy each other than to live life in peace. But you can understand John Lennon's cynicism about organized religion and the cause of harmony and peace where religion and violence have been no strangers over the centuries. And when we think about the Christian church internally, we don't always think about living life in peace either, of a model of people living in true union and harmony with each other, sharing a common purpose and sharing everything they have with one another, like those first disciples in the book of Acts. Sadly, the history of the Christian church is one of division, it's one of disagreement and schism right down to our day, which has been to the great detriment of Christ's message. The sort of community that's described at the beginning of Acts is one then that sounds rather idyllic, but also probably sounds unrealistic to many of us, maybe more like a hippie commune in California in the 60s or a new age traveling community now. But there's still something very attractive in the simplicity of it all when we read it, in the simplicity of their sharing, in the sentiment of their sincerity, and not least in the way that their witness brought many others to join their number. In verse 47, enjoying the favor of all the people. Here is a glimpse of an ideal Christian community, even if it was to be short-lived. For later in the New Testament, we find the letters of Paul to various new Christian communities around the Mediterranean that things haven't quite worked out the way they were planned. Arguments have arisen. Factions and followings are causing disruption. It's with some sadness that we might realize that the perfect original community has become more like some Christian communities and church denominations that we might recognize. 2,000 years later, the story can be just the same. We have our ideals set out in our holy book, but a reality of division and disagreement can be close at hand. We might only ever aspire to achieve the perfect union of that early Christian community, but it's in the aspiration of that unity that we walk onward with Christ and he walks with us. So, what have the monks ever done for us? In seeking to the formation of a community united in the love of Christ, in seeking the unity of work and worship as they did. Maybe the images from this week are as pow powerful as any, the images of gathering round a table to eat together, of offering hospitality to the stranger and the pilgrim, an open and responsive and loving place to be for everyone, enjoying the fruits of God's grace together. And also the image of tending the good earth in the garden, of caring for God's creation, 
of growing the food he has given us and of resting too on the seventh day. Whether or not a community of unity and harmony is fully attainable, even just as a glimpse. Maybe our task ahead is like the gardener in the act of tilling and of working the soil. Our task is missional, to labor in the field, in the vineyard of the Lord. Without all the answers, but within the mystery, to be with God in creation and to take our part in furthering his kingdom, to act for ourselves and for others as he would have us do in the faith of Jesus Christ, to witness in what we say and do, and to wait for the seeds to grow in his good time. Martin Luther is said to have commented, even if I knew tomorrow would go to pieces, I would still plant my apple tree. We act according to longer term consequences, not short term gain. To plant a tree, to till the soil for a while, literally or metaphorically, no matter who will ever taste its fruit, but knowing that it will provide in time. The future is in God's hands. Ken Untener wrote a prayer for Archbishop Romero, the Archbishop who was murdered in El Salvador, saying, we are workers, not master builders. We are ministers, not messiahs. We are prophets of a future which is not our own. Slowly and surely, as the ground is tended, may we plant the seed and till the soil so that real fruit might be born in time. Love, togetherness, community, reconciliation, harmony, and at last, peace, an authentic faith, and a real hope for the world. Imagine all the people. Amen. Shall we join together in prayer? Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for this place, for these people, for this community, for the church, the body of Christ, a place of real people with all our gifts and all our flaws, with joys and struggles with united vision and sometime disagreements who still look out for one another. A place that celebrates both togetherness and difference, where we can all belong. A place of faith and of doubt. A place of awkward stumbling towards Christ-likeness. A place of worship, of mystery, and of rest. This is the place here, Lord. Not the buildings or the furniture. No us, the people, Lord, who gather each week in your name and sometimes have to try hard to remember each other's names. And for this place, and your being with us here, a community together in Christ. We give our heartfelt thanks. We offer our devotion today. We thank you, Lord, of all creation, from whom comes all life and work and purpose. You placed Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden to till and keep it. You have given humanity the role to care for and protect this earth and to live and to eat from its abundant harvest. You have called us to tend 
and to grow like gardeners on this earth, to work to look after ourselves, our loved ones, and to offer hospitality to the stranger and the pilgrim. You gave dignity to our labor by sending your son to labor with us. And through our contributions together in work, paid and voluntary, full-time, part-time, or just for a little while now and again, you have made us co-creators with you, shaping the world in which we live. Through our efforts, you enrich the world, Lord. Through our efforts, we enjoy the fruits of creation. Through our efforts, we find direction and purpose in this world you have created with all of its natural beauty and riches and food and shelter for all, were this world only to ensure that the needs of all people were met. We pray, Lord, for the earth and the people within it, people whose names we know and whose presence we cherish, thanking you for joyful news when it comes and asking you for peace, comfort and strength when times are hard. And we pray, Lord, for people whose names we will never know, whose faces flash across the TV screen, those who bear the weight this day of inhumanity and greed, of vengeance and violence, those with whom the natural bounty of this earth is not shared. We and they, Lord God, are in need in these days of a fuller glimpse of the kingdom of God, which Jesus came to inaugurate, to know again the truth that love is stronger than hate, that peace is possible, that the abundance of this earth is for everyone, that all people are loved and held by an everlasting God, and that fullness of life can emerge even in the midst of war, injustice, and hunger. We pray, Lord, for those truths to be known, and that all life and work and purpose within the church and beyond can bring a kingdom of love and peace and justice more fully towards a reality. In Jesus' name, we pray together. Amen. Our final hymn in our worship today is number 624, In Christ There Is No East or West.
We say together our closing responses on the order of service. We go in the power of the Spirit to live and work to God's glory. May the strength of God guide us, the power of God preserve us, the wisdom of God instruct us, the Spirit of God be within us. And may the blessing and the love of God, the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sustainer be with each one of us and everyone whom we love, now and always.